Okay. Hi, Gabrielle. How you doing? Well, I'm doing great. How are you doing today, Mike? I'm doing great, thanks. Um, you know, it snowed today. Did you see? I know. It? I'm sad. Yeah. Well, my I, I did. My daughter Emma was so happy last night. She was saying. Dad, I hope it snows tomorrow, and I can't wait because that means I can play Christmas songs. So <laughs> we're, we're not quite <laughs> ready. For, we're not quite ready for that yet. But uh, anyway, well, listen, uh, we're going to spend some time talking about insurance, the health insurance, as we know, the health insurance exchange in Michigan is the federal program. That's correct, right? It's with the healthcare.gov, and uh, you're. <laughs> You're uh, getting your screens ready there, and we're going to also look at that. We'll have this available, um, the, sh the actual screen showing as well as we look at this stuff. But we just want to talk a little bit about the enrollment process first. Um, Gabrielle, no Gabrielle, why don't you just walk us through the uh, enrollment problem or the enrollment problem, yeah, enrollment process for individuals. I mean, when, when do they have to get started for 2015, et cetera? Okay, Mike. Well, uh, for 2015, I think the most important thing to note is that you want to go to healthcare.gov. If you believe that you may be eligible for a subsidy or a tax credit to help you pay the premium on the health insurance. And I do like to remind everybody that the health insurance is still delivered through the carriers we know, and I'll put in parentheses, love. Sometimes we love to hate, but you're going to see Coverage is delivered by Priority Health, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, and other other insurance companies you know. So the healthcare.gov piece is about determining whether you're eligible for the subsidy tax credit to help pay the premium on your health insurance on a monthly basis. So to get started with some some go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, um, if you were, if if a person's looking at that, what what do they need to be looking at specifically? You know, okay, so how do I know whether I'm eligible or not for the subsidy? That's a super good question. What I always do uh, when I'm working with customers is we go right to the incomes that qualify chart, which I've brought up onto the screen. And we use that as a guideline. So what you can see here is you may qualify for low, lower premiums on the marketplace uh, if your yearly income is between, and then here is one person in the tax household, incomes that range here. If you have two people in the tax household, incomes that range here, and et cetera. Now, we are a state that expanded Medicaid. So if you look right down here, it says that if your income is below this amount based on your household, number of household people in your tax household, then you're actually going to be uh, offered the Medicaid, the expanded Medicaid program here in Michigan. Okay. So when I'm sitting and chatting with people, I, some of the things I do is ask right away, what do you estimate your income to be? What was it like this last year? Is it going to be different? And those are some of the same questions that are asked in the application for subsidy. And if somebody comes to me and their incomes fall within, this is a lower number, and this as a higher number, then I say, okay, it looks like you may be eligible for subsidy. It's probably worthwhile for us to work together on a healthcare.gov subsidy application, and then we move forward into the subsidy application. Right. If, and those number if, number if, of people in your household, one, two, three, four, five, six, you've got there, and that's basically the dependents that you're showing on your tax return. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And I, I, I always like to use the term tax household because sometimes people have, you know, young people in their household who are maybe 23 or 24, but have enough income themselves and they're filing their own tax return. So they they may be in the household, but they're not in the tax household. Right. They're not in the tax household, but are they not computed their earnings and such for the purposes of this credit? 
it kind of depends on what the situation is in each family. Okay. So it, it is it is family. It, it's situational, right. <laughs> if you will. Right. So, right. Uh, but you know, we can start here. This gives us a good guideline as to whether we ought to move forward with a healthcare.gov subsidy application, or whether, in fact, you know, somebody comes to me with a tax household of four and they say we make, you know, we made a hundred thousand dollars last year and we expect to make more this year, I'm going to say, you know, you're probably not eligible for a subsidy. Let's go ahead and look at the insurance plans that are available to you. They're all Affordable Care Act compliant, but you do not need to go through healthcare.gov to buy that insurance. And the prices for the insurance are the same, whether you're buying off of the healthcare.gov or on the healthcare.gov. Gabrielle, um, I don't okay. think we mentioned yet uh the dates did we talk about the dates the enrollment dates well we did it and i think what uh, the first thing is open enrollment for 2015 begins november 15th and if we look at this chart here you can see that open enrollment starts on the 15th so that simply means that you can start seeing the plans that are available and applying for a January 1st effective date. So if you enroll between November 15th and December 15th, then your effective date will be January 1st of 2015. If you enroll between December 15th and January 15th, your effective date will be February 1st. If you enroll between January 15th and February 15th, your effective date will be March 1st. But you can see here that open enrollment for 2015 ends on February 15th. After that date, the only way you can purchase individual insurance at healthcare.gov with a subsidy is during a special enrollment period. And special enrollment periods uh, apply when you have certain qualifying events. So qualifying events might be you've had a marriage or a divorce, you're adding a, a baby or a child, you've changed residence and you've maybe left the service area of the insurance, you've lost coverage due to losing it through your job or your COBRA coverage is ending or you're aging off of a parent's plan or you're no longer eligible for Medicaid or for a lot of children I've run into for the My Child program. Otherwise, we're going to be doing open enrollment starting November 15th and ending February 15th. Okay. Now, one thing you mentioned to me when we had lunch together, which was a surprise to me, I, w I didn't realize this, and I, I want to make sure that our listeners and, and the people in the office understand as well, but you said that even if I buy insurance from a regular, let's say I'm not going through the exchange, I'm just going to go to a carrier like in our state, it'd be Priority Health, maybe Blue Cross, Blue Shield, um, one of the other major carriers, and I want individual insurance. You were telling me that the enrollment period is the same as what, it's, what it is for the uh, healthcare.gov. Is that right? That is correct, and uh, it's been a big surprise to a lot of people that, uh, you know, previously if a person wanted to buy individual health insurance, they could come to me any time of year. We would enroll them in the coverage of their choice. There would be health care underwriting, so they could be denied due to health insurance, you know, health issues, but, you know, if they passed underwriting, then they could have whatever effective date they were desiring. Right. That all changed on January 1st, 2014, when everybody moved to an open enrollment scenario. So for people who are uh, not eligible for a tax credit subsidy, and they're simply buying individual insurance because it is still required, and there's a tax penalty if you don't have it, they must purchase during open enrollment or during a special qualifying event. Wow. Okay, so before and for that qualifying oh, event, it's important to know that you've got 60 days to take action when you've had a qualifying event. So I did have a young man I talked with earlier today 
like, okay, I'm ready to put coverage in place. And I had to share with him that we would only be able to enroll him January 1st during open enrollment because his qualifying event loss of coverage actually happened back in June. So he didn't take action during that 60-day period. Wow. That's a good point, too, isn't it? People need to pay attention to those dates, unfortunately. Hey, they bef really do. Before we uh, start looking at maybe just the process of getting on healthcare.gov, let's just talk for a minute about businesses. In the past, a business would be able to apply for a tax credit. Uh, it's called the Small Business business health insurance credit and I would have clients that that qualify for that beginning in 2014 however the only way they're going to get that credit is if they purchase the insurance through healthcare.gov so or through the marketplace or the um, health insurance exchange, whatever we're calling this shop. I think it's referred to as shop as well. And I know that you don't have a lot of information as far as, you know, how that works uh, to get, you know, enrolled and all that and all what it includes because a lot of that hasn't been introduced yet. But could you just talk a little bit about that business piece? Sure, I'd be happy to. And I did bring up the screen that's for employers. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I'd always say is, you know, contact me as an agent or someone like me as an agent who handles and is certified to do uh, shop insurance. Uh, because what they're going to do is you can do this two ways. You can do it online or you can do a paper application. But the employer is going to fill out an app application for their group to determine, to get an eligibility statement saying, yes, you're eligible for the tax credit. Here's here's how much your tax credit's going to be because it's different depending on the group's situation. So I'm going to go ahead and go to that for employers section. And it talks about, like I said, using an agent or broker, how to do that because a lot, a lot of small group insurance is done, a, a, an agent is always involved. It's very rarely that uh, you can purchase group insurance direct without an agent helping you. So, because the insurance companies don't do it. <laughs> so, uh, so if you have 50 or fewer employees, then you can use this shop marketplace to offer coverage. And what you would do is you'd come right on here and select your state. And then you'd hit the apply now button. And it would take you to information about how to enroll. Um, and as I said, you can use a, a paper application and sit down with the agent, get it filled out, send it in, and then they'll send you the eligibility. In all cases, the eligibility on this is not instantaneous. It's going to come in a couple of days to a week. Okay. So you'll see it says right here, start by contacting your agent or broker or a preferred insurance company. And remember that this is not just the state of Michigan. Healthcare.gov and SHOP is nationwide, so there may be some insurance companies in other states that do things differently. Right. Here in Michigan, it'd be best to get, get your broker in hand. And then you choose the best plan for you. Um, now, here's one of the things that's pretty important. Not all of the group plans that are available are available for tax credit. And that's true even within a particular insurer. So if I use, for example, Priority Health, and I'm working with a small business, and they're we've determined they're eligible for the tax credit, and maybe we've done some quoting previous, and they were looking at one of Priority's plans and saying, wow, that sounds like the right plan for our group. We need to go back and make sure that plan is eligible for the shop tax credit because Priority Health in 2014 had about 30 variety of small group plans, but there were only eight of them that were available for the shop tax credit. Okay. So what's the uh, enrollment period that a business, I mean, we talked about an individual having the beginning process starting November 15th 
assuming everything is up and running. Uh, we know we had problems with that last year. And then, or, um, and the ending period being February 15th, what, what about businesses that are looking at renewals and or starting this process? What do they have to be thinking about when it comes to dates? Well, the good news for businesses is that uh, they do not have to adhere to the individual open enrollment guidelines. Okay. So as a business, you can enroll through shop for small group health insurance with the tax credit for any first of the month effective date during the year. But I do suggest that people get started on this 90 to 120 days in advance of when they think they'd like the effective date to be. And that's probably going to be based upon the effective date that they have under their current plan, right? If they have a plan. And it really could, it, it truly could be. Mm -hmm. But I would say that you know, if somebody has a January 1st effective date now, they're starting this process now, it turns out that maybe they can't make their decision until February 1st or, you know, things get in the way and there's holidays. Um, they, they certainly could make it start February 1st. Okay. So the good thing for businesses is they're not, they're not stuck with having to only enroll during the annual individual open enrollment period. Okay. We've got much more flexibility with that. All right, great. Why don't you take us through the, at least the initial stages of getting on the healthcare.gov as an individual and some of the information that they would have to have available to, you know, do an application. You mentioned having your tax returns done. We're thinking from a tax preparer standpoint that there will be many clients coming to us in, say, well, we think everything's going to be delayed. Let's just put it that way because of, of some of the stuff that's going on, even the forms and, and tax software and everything that has to be ready to go probably isn't even going to be ready the 1st of February when we normally have it ready. And so it might be a little bit later. And so let's say we have a client coming in here in March or so and now all of a sudden they need to know how to do this it's part of why we want to put this video together at least start informing our clients and others to say hey you know if you need health insurance start thinking about it now and maybe even using your 2013 return to start to estimate the the income levels and so on and so forth. Like you said, has anything really changed from 2013 to 2014? Do you expect a big change in 2015, you know? So um, what do they need to know? What do they need to, how do they go through this process? So, I think it is one of the problems, Mike, that a lot of people are going to deal with this first couple of years in this new way of doing things. And that is that you are estimating what your what your income is and the questions on the healthcare.gov subsidy application ask things like what will your income be for 2015 will it look like 2014 uh, and i understand that a lot of people will not have done their taxes for 2014 yet when we're already being asked to start estimating for 2015. Mm -hmm. So I just ask people to be, you know, careful with their estimation, but always remember that if you get halfway through the year and realize that your estimation was off, either too high or too low, that we call healthcare.gov and we let them know about those adjustments. And that may mean a change in the subsidy, but that also means that you'll be getting the more true subsidy and will have less troubles with having to pay back some subsidy you might not have been eligible for due to an underestimation of income for the year. And so we want to make sure people do take the time to think those things through. Um, here is an application checklist. Before you go, before you, you go, before you go to that, I wanted to make a point, and that is, 
Okay. Some of the clients that I've had that are on the insurance exchange, I have actually contacted them to say, let's take a look at your income for 2014 to see if it's a lot higher or lower than what it was in 2013, which we use to you know estimate the 2014 income so that they could get the subsidy on the exchange. Well, correct. Um, what we're having trouble with, and maybe you just answered that, and I just want to make sure we point that out or we discuss that just a little bit, and that is when we look at it and we say, okay, well, we know what their income levels is, are. We're not sure what their premiums would be and whether or not they're going to have to pay back any of that money. So what you're saying is get with you and then call the uh, – maybe you'll know or call the um, – healthcare.gov or contact them to see what the discounts would be or the or the subsidies would be for the insurance, right? Because that, that's my fear Correct. is that I have a client come in and then they get their tax returns done and then we find out that their income was too high for the subsidy they received and now they owe a bunch more tax. I agree that it's good to look at that about mid-year and see if you've been in the right position because people do have changes that occur and then we can make changes mid-year at healthcare.gov, and they will adjust the subsidy okay. so that you're not in a situation of having to pay a big chunk of money. Okay. So what? I can give an example. Mm -hmm. I can give an example of uh, one of my customers who uh, mid-year called me and said, hey, I had to take $30,000 out of an IRA, which is income, uh, because he had to rebuild a barn because of a storm that blew it down. So we had originally estimated his income pretty soundly. But a circumstance occurred mid-year that caused that caused you know him to have an additional thirty thousand of income uh, for his two thousand and fourteen tax year. So we agreed that he we should call healthcare.gov and let them know that and make those adjustments so that he wouldn't have a big additional tax surprise over and above what he has to pay because he pulled money out of an IRA, right? Right. Um, so so that kind of stuff does happen. And that's the best, my best advice. Now, sometimes it'll be somebody's a little worried because they're making, you know, one or two thousand dollars more than they thought. And I always just ask them, you know, do you know what your tax rate is, and would you be able to set aside now what we could estimate, you know, you would have to pay if they adjust your income. And so, for somebody who's maybe only got a one or two thousand dollar adjustment in income. They should just know to set aside a couple hundred bucks for subsidy that they may have received that may be asked to be paid back. But if you get a little bigger than that, then it's important to make those calls. Thanks for clarifying that because that has been a point of confusion, I know, and we're looking at it, so that's helpful. Okay, let's go to your market. And I think it's, a, it's a tough year for us because we've all estimated for 2014 – we haven't seen how it shakes out, and now we're being asked to estimate for 2015. <laughs> right, right. All That's right. crazy. Yeah, it is. All right, so back, back to what you should do in preparation for doing a marketplace application. First of all, here's a nice checklist that will give you the kind of information you need to have handy when you fill out your application for subsidy at healthcare.gov. And you'd want to have this handy if you were, uh, you know, working with someone like myself, sitting down, doing the application together, or whether you're doing the application yourself. So obviously you're going to have the home and mailing address for everyone applying, social security numbers, uh, Im Im immigration documentation in case somebody is a non-U.S. Non citizen, employer and income information for everybody in the household, so we're looking at pay stubs, W-2 forms, and any wage and tax statement. That includes the children. It does. I do want to point out that that's only true if the young person making income is still on your tax return. Right. I do have some folks in families where, you know, maybe they have a 22, 23, 24-year-old who has been on their health insurance and lives in their household. But, you know, they have a full-time job and they're making their own income, and they're filing their own tax return. In that case, they are not a part of the tax household. So we might do a subsidy application for them separately. and They might end up with their own coverage 
and their own subsidy. And every family situation, like I said, is different. So, you know, your single people are easy. <laughs> but <laughs> right. but right. the families can get complicated, and that's okay. So, you kind of, again, you're looking to make the best estimate of what your household income is going to be for 2015. You also want to have handy any policy numbers for anybody who currently has health insurance in the family. Many of your people may be uh, offered coverage through work or they're not offered coverage through work, but either way, they may need a completed employer coverage tool. And basically that says, you know, who your employer is, what insurance they offer you, how much it costs, and some things like that. You know, if you are clearly not offered coverage through your employer because you're either a sole proprietor or your employer doesn't provide coverage, then that isn't going to come into play. And then if you have already been receiving subsidy in 2014 for healthcare.gov, then you may have received some notices from them, and you probably want to have those handy as well. But let's just kind of uh, move forward to talk about those people who have not done this before. So the first step is getting to healthcare.gov, and you'll see that right now it says make sure you're ready to enroll starting November 15th. And this front screen does change, so it may not look like this in a few weeks. But I'm going to go ahead and hit Learn How and Create an Account and Apply Right Now, which I found in the middle of that page. So you will find that it isn't, sometimes it's a little more confusing than it should be. Then you pick your state, and it reminds you that you can't really apply right now, but we can start an application and set an account up. So I'm going to go ahead and hit continue. And so it's going to give me, you know, an opportunity to set up my account. Obviously, I'd put my name in, mm -hmm. and then an email address, and I want to just caution people that may have tried this last year and maybe gave up on it or what have you. If your email address has been used, it will come back and tell you that, you know, you, you need to use a different email address or, well, you already have an account. Then you would create, you, so you're going to put in your email address, which is going to be your user ID. Some people who did this last year, that is not the case. But from here on out, the email address you use is going to be your username when you log in. Then you're going to put in your password. Then it asks you to pick some questions to verify your identity in case you have to do a password reset. It's going to ask these questions. So I do encourage people to, you know, have a little notebook and write all of this stuff down. Oh, yeah. Write down what you used as a password. And if you have to, you know, set up a new email address, I did one called it, you know, Gab's 622 Calendar. I only use it for healthcare.gov and my calendar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, you may have to do something like that. Don't let it frustrate you. And you pick a question and say, you know, what's my favorite radio station? And you put in your answer. Perhaps you like what city your mother was born in, and you put in your answer. Um, who's your favorite the, account? Who's your favorite accountant? You know. Who's yeah. your favorite accountant? <laughs> yeah. Who's the best insurance agent in the world? Yeah. I know who. Right. Right. Now, okay. this is kind of personal opinion, but. Look at the boxes that you're seeing because if you leave things like I want to have news and updates sent to this email and it's optional, you're going to get news and updates and it might become a little spammy at times. You can unmark that and then they won't send you anything besides what has to do with your eligibility. And then you, I encourage people to read the privacy policies, but you hit understand I understand and agree with healthcare.gov's privacy policy, all right? Mm -hmm. and then you hit create account. Now, what happens next is that it'll say, we just sent an email to the email address that you've used. Mm -hmm. So you go over to your email address, find that, and you click the link, and it will move you forward to the account. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go to a test account that I just recently created okay. to show you what happens as you say, I already have an account. Because doing that whole setting up the account is the first step. So I've put in my account name 
user ID and my password. I'm going to go ahead and hit login, and we'll find out if it's working today. You mean it doesn't always work? Mm. <laughs> well, I did get a notice that it's supposed to be down after 4 p.m. today for upgrades. Oh, I see. So You never know. So sometimes they have it down. All right? So it says, Gabrielle, where would I like to go? Well, if I were an employer, because we talked about the business stuff earlier, and I was wanting to learn more about it, what I can do with the shop exchange, I would go to visit employers for employers. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to go for employees, because I'm an employee of that employer, I would go here to employee. Because one of the things about the shop exchange, and I know I've switched subjects, but is that once the employer sets up the account, gets themselves approved for tax credit, picks the plan that they're going to have their employees enroll in, then they can potentially have the employees come on to the account and enroll themselves. Oh, okay. That would really be better when an employer is allowed to have a couple of plan choices. Mm -hmm. Currently, that's not allowed. So. You know, if I had a, 10 employees, but I was allowed to have three plan choices, then my employees could come in and each one pick which plan was best for them. In the meantime, a lot of that work is still being done with the, the business and the, um, the agent via paper. But that's here, and that might confuse people in the future, especially individuals. But I'm here as an individual, so I'm going to visit the marketplace for individuals and families. That's what I would do, and then I would say apply and shop for coverage for me and my family. So then it comes back and says, a Michigan application, and it reminds us of the kind of things we may need. And so now it's going to ask for all of my personal information. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and hit continue. And note that I haven't put any of that information in yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's not like you're going on. It's but going to, it, right. It's going to go. So here's what happens. It's going to go ahead and ask you to do all of this. Right. 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 And you'll notice that this is the verifying your identity and contact information. That it comes back and says, your identity could not be er verified. Try fixing this error. Records indicate you've already registered. If you've forgotten your user ID, please select forgot user ID if you're not already registered and check the information I entered. So the, the, once, once you've gotten through that individual, that piece up front, then it's going to say that it, it wants to ask some verification questions to verify that I am who I say I am. And one of the things in the privacy piece is that it says, hey, you know, we're going to go to DHS, we're going to go to IRS, we're going to go to Social Security, we're going to go to all these places electronically to verify your information, including uh, Equifax or another, uh, you know, credit company, credit reporting agency. So what they do is they take your social security number and your information, ship it off to Equifax. Equifax comes back and delivers four or five questions that it is expected only you would know the answer to. Things like, in 2003, you leased a car. What brand and year of, of car was it? And then they'll give you a multiple choice. And if none of the above is one of the answers, then you can choose that. Uh, but if if I had bought a, you know, if I had leased that year a, a Honda and that's in the list, then I'd pick that. Then it might say something like, at some point in the past 10, 15 years, you worked at this one of these organizations. And it'll list organizations. You find one that you worked for, you pick it. Once you've verified your identity, then you move into the actual income application where it starts to ask you, who all do you want to cover, who's all involved, what's everybody's income, what's their social security numbers. Um, and there are sometimes some confusing questions about is so-and-so a father of so-and-so and does so-and-so live in the household? When you get to those kind of questions, it seems confusing, but just take it real logically is all I can say. Right, right. And we may need to come back to this when it's live. Right. Now that's that's been 
very helpful. And I think even what we've done today in discussing the um, individuals, the start dates, um, the businesses and how they can get on board and the fact that only those that qualify for the insurance credits probably want to use the healthcare.gov or the shop program. That would be uh, really good. And just starting this process early enough to get through this would be fantastic. So you have your information yep. up there, but um, just for those that are listening to this and not necessarily watching, why don't you share with them on how they can get a hold of you? Anything you want to share, like uh, you know your your telephone number, your website, your um, address, email account, whatever it is that you'd like to, um, sure. those people to get a hold of you, and then we'll let you go. Oh, all right. Well, up on the screen is my InnovativeSolutionsAgency.com welcome page, and for anybody who is looking at the screen you'll be able to uh, go right in here. Nobody will harass you. If you're wanting to find out how much health insurance costs or estimate your subsidy, you can do that through my site. It is only an estimation, but it does give you a feel for, am I in the ballpark? What are the pricing going to be? What do the plans look like? Um, to reach me personally, feel free to ring me at 616-732. 9000. Again, that's 616 732 9000. And do leave a message if you don't get a hold of me. I can also be reached through the contact form at my website. And I can be reached by email at gabwar at sign innovative solutions agency.com. Awesome. Gabrielle, this uh, whole health care thing, I began the show with talking about the complications and just things that are changing and and uh, the confusion. And it's just good to have people like you who are willing to, to come online with us and talk it through for people, help bring some clarity to it, um, be there as a resource for us and or our clients that are looking for health insurance and uh, so it's been real beneficial to meet with you today and take this time to just kind of go through things. We had a little technical di difficulty, but I'll work through that. And, uh, and I just really appreciate your time today. Well, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to uh, show what it is I've learned and how I've helped customers as well, Mike. So thanks for having me today. Oh,